You know, great. So I guess one thing I say to everyone before I start is that I'm originally from Trinidad and Tobago in the Caribbean, because people say they often um, miss the first part of my talk trying to guess where I'm from. So now you guys all know. <laughs> so full attention. Um, so I should say that um, I think the main topic of this talk is, you know, you can see in the title, how do we take technology and constantly enhance it and improve it? And I think to get intelligent technologies, you know, we want to include machine learning, artificial intelligence, psychology, human interaction. But I think actually the key to this really is for us to rethink how we do randomized experiments. So I think we should do experiments that are collaborative, that are dynamic and personalized. And I'll talk more about what I mean by that. So one kind of aside to, um, is um, I made this Google Doc, um, Tiny.cg stats. If you go to that URL and plug it in, it'll pop open. But I'll send this out to everyone because after all these great talks, I feel like we, we'll forget all these brilliant ideas and references. So I'm gonna use that as a place where I compile like, links to references. I'm gonna put the slides, link to the slides in here. There's also, they're also up on the website. And I'll also, I'm recording this. So I'll actually include a link to the recording and then you can share it with other colleagues who might be interested in this work. Um, another thing I would say is that, right, I'm just starting in Toronto, so I'm like working with like, 0.5 of grad students from different groups, so I'm just starting to recruit. But I do have a research group meeting with um, research program and other people, and I actually have them online. So every week we have it in person, but we have a Google Hangout. So if you, um, any of your students want to join, we have a mailing list, people can hear what's relevant and come whenever they like. Or what is great actually is if people want to give presentations. You can just jump on the Hangouts and give a 20 minute, 30 minute, one hour presentation. So it's kind of thinking of how do we take a lab that's in one place and make it almost like a distributed network. So anyone's welcome to join, listen to the mailing list, um, message me sometimes. If you want to present or have your students present, that's great. Cool. All right, so I'm actually um, going to start off with um, a bit of a prelude, right? Trying to, I basically had my standard talk, and then over the past few days I realized I think there's a set of key issues I want to surface, because they're most of interest to people in the room. So let me give a couple of prelude of the questions I think that I'm tackling that especially relevant to applied statisticians. Then I'll jump into the actual standard talk. So I think the agenda I said is, I want to think about how we make dynamic experiments ubiquitous. Everyone in Facebook, um, in mobile health and education, all these psychologists, education researchers, economists, how do we get them to start running dynamic experiments in technology? And let me be concrete. Um, we, to do that, we need to make it easy for every practitioner to start doing experiments. We have to give them algorithms that are available on the web. And for behavioral scientists, we have to give them analysis methods, which is what a lot of you specialize in, so that they can run these experiments, know how to analyze them, and then the experiments can actually lead to enhancing and personalizing technology. So to be really concrete, what I mean by dynamic experiments, let me try and translate between vocabulary, is a, a RCT, often on a behavioral intervention, for example, send people messages to get them to exercise, with outcome or response adaptive randomization. For example, um, if the outcome was step count, imagine you send text message A versus B, and you end up with things like 70% of people get A, 30% get B, but then that changes over time as you analyze the data. So people know about um, algorithms and multi arm bandits, but I'll expand, expand on them. What I mean by a dynamic and personalizing experiment is the RCT where we use adaptive randomization to transition from giving conditions and arms, let's say uniformly, to actually subgroups that benefit the most. So this is what I'm really excited about. And you end up with things like the probability of a text message A given low motivation might be 0.8, probability of B is 0.2, sorry, <laughs> typos, anyway. Probability of A given low motivation is 0.8, probability of B 0.2, the probability of B uh, given motivation is high, would be point, sorry, probability of A given motivation is high is 0.4, probability of B is 0.6. So sorry for the typos, I actually added all this in like this morning because I was really excited to get your input. But I think you get the idea. The randomization probabilities might differ for subgroups of people. So we're transitioning from experimenting to discover what's working to actually delivering a product, a personalized experience. And so I think the reason I'm, I'm, pushing, I'm excited about this approach is I see experimentation as a bridge between designers for example, um, someone's building a mobile health app, and behavioral scientists who want to advance theories of how people learn, whether it's psychologists or people um, in the health domain, and statistics and machine learning. People who care about making intelligent systems, analyzing data, they're gonna think about how to do these experiments dynamically. So I see experiments as a bridge between them. And so I think we need to figure out how to make experiments, how to do experiments in new ways that meet the goals of these different stakeholders. So an example could be, 
how do we increase step count by testing alternative messages? Like, what's your plan for exercising today? Let's just imagine how you'll feel after exercising today. Just really simple examples, not necessarily high quality enough to run a study on right now, but I'm just trying to make it concrete. Which of these is going to impact steps more? And which one will impact steps more for subgroups of people? For example, based on whether you're low or high motivation, based on whether um, today is the day you wanted to exercise or not. I should say I'm especially interested in doing more high dimensional factorial experiments. I run these experiments all the time, and what's the biggest barrier? Nothing has an effect. All those brilliant ideas that there were 10 theories saying should have an effect, no effect. So we need to, in a way, we need to come up with better ways of discovering what's going to work. And I think, for example, factorial experiments are one way, where you can actually run, test many different ideas at once. Now, of course, as soon as you start showing this, like a bunch of economists or psychologists, they start to think, well, that can't be right. You're testing too many hypotheses. Um, how do you even do inference? I think applied statisticians are often much less worried than all those people, because you guys know how to deal with these things. But we need to show them when it's appropriate, when it's not, and how they can analyze this kind of data. Another big area is wellness and mental health. So how do we increase people's subjective report or long-term anxiety measures through micro-CBT? Let's take the big ideas of CBT and translate them into usable things that people can actually get benefit from now. For example, what's bothering you right now versus what's an action you can take to feel better? How do we test out which of these questions get people to feel better in the moment and longer term? And again, I should say, these are just, yeah, please. Oh yes, thank you very much, yeah. So CBT stands for Cognitive Behavior Therapy. So it's basically a clinical, uh, set of clinical methods about how do you help people reduce anxiety, depression, or negative feelings by changing the way they think about situations. Thanks. And again, I'm, I'm throwing these things up as examples without references, but I've done work collaborating with clinical psychologists and published papers on how to help people learn CBT. So there's this huge behavioral science um, context, and, and those are things we're familiar with and work within. And there are many other areas. Um, I'm pretty open to where we apply it. I think my guiding goals right now are what are settings where we can actually get interesting effects, where we can actually figure out how to personalize or tailor, because it's actually kind of rare to see those effects, and where we can apply dynamic methods of experimentation. So we get shorter term outcome variables, we think those are reasonable things to do. So that's what I'm really excited about now, and I've actually chosen these domains because I think they're especially promising. So let me just give you a laundry list, just to get you thinking of, I think, what I think is statistics relevant work or potential collaboration. And this is just a fire hose. <laughs> so how do we, in general, apply reinforced learning like multi unbalanced experiments? So I think you get that's a general approach. But I'm open to other approaches, um, especially if I have more sophisticated collaborators who know about SMART and micro-randomized trials. Well, how do we conduct hypothesis tests on data collected that's using adaptive randomization? People have said really interesting ideas about how to modify the algorithm for data collection, as well as the analysis. And one thing I should say that I think is unique when you work with like my group, for example, is that we design and run experiments. If, for example, someone told me we should actually, when we use Thompson Assembly, we should do probability clipping. We're not going to give you some data that you have to do all kinds of craziness with. We will just modify the algorithm on the server so that it does that. And then we're going to make that available to any behavioral scientist who wants to use that open source code. So it's a really nice part in terms of designing. If we want to use fa factorial experiments with adaptive randomization to discover how to personalize based on covariates, you have a setting where we might be actually manipulating five factors in terms of an exercise message, and we've got 10 covariates. So we want to use adaptive randomization in that setting to figure out, one is to help people, but also we're kind of balancing multiple goals at once. We're trying to figure out which of these factors interact with which covariates. Which of these actually lead to interactions that are heterogeneous, but they're not qualitative. They don't actually make a difference for personalization. And so that's an example of a question we want to tackle. And when I show these things to behavioral scientists, they instantly are like worried. You're testing too many hypotheses. If you do adaptive randomization, can we even analyze the data? And for good reasons sometimes. But this is what we have to sort out to get these methods to be widespread. Um, so how do we do appropriate hypothesis tests? And we're also open to Bayesian analysis. My approach is just that if you publish a paper, I'd like to see both. If you really like Bayesian analysis, then I'd also like to see the frequentist version of it because people understand how to use those methods. I know how to evaluate them because I've read a thousand papers using null hypothesis testing. I've read 10 using Bayesian analysis. So I'm open to all of that. Another big issue that comes up is handling these large numbers of covariates. So right now we're designing experiments with economists. And you know, should we plug like 15 variables into the pre into the survey to measure covariates? Um, 
what, what are the costs of that? You know, can we just flow it all into a big regression and use lasso and everything will be fine? Or is it that we should narrow it down to five? So helping people understand the cost of trading off the number of covariates. Should we be including some kind of prior knowledge about what's really likely to have an effect versus not? And how do we actually enter this in? Do we just, for example, if, let me be very concrete. If we ask people to rate their political affiliation from one to seven, do we just plot that into regression and then hope that there's some kind of linear effect that's reasonable? Or should we be trying to do some kind of binning or something that's better? These are the kind of questions that are coming up right now when we're designing experiments. Another line of work um, is also thinking, well, I think the key thing with adaptive randomization is it's meant to do experimentation in a way that's actually benefiting participants more quickly, benefiting people using your app or students in online course. But could it actually be the case that using adaptive randomization might actually enhance discovery? Like, are there cases where it increases statistical power? So Ken showed some in his talk. For example, when you're testing like eight different options in a smart, adaptive randomization might give you more power to detect, oh, here are the two better ones. And the, you get more power to say, these are the two best, these are the two worst, even if you lose power for individual comparisons. In the kind of modeling we've done, there have been interesting things we found where, for example, when two conditions are different in the variability of the means, using adaptive randomization can actually increase power because you sample the condition with high variability more. And that was from applying, uh, looking at a real experiment. We weren't anticipating it. But as you know, we often lose power. So right now, we just actually submitted a large grant to National Science Foundation with my collaborators at UC Irvine that's really all about how do we test out this kind of dynamic experimentation approach in the context of education. And I'm very open to um, working with people to submit to NIH grants. I, I did that when I was in grad school at Berkeley. And there are a lot of collaborators we have in the US who I think would be super excited to jump in on this. Behavioral scientists will say, is it possible we can do these things? Um, and if they can get you involved, I think they're super happy to do it. I'm working with one team right now at UC Berkeley that does, is try to use text messaging to help um, uh, Latino and Latino adults who have diabetes and depression. So how do we get them working and exercising more? And I think they come to me because they want this kind of expertise. Another thing is adding new conditions during experiments. So this is something that we want to do. I'm kind of giving you practical things that I think from my experience running and talking to people will be helpful, and we can, you can help us figure out these stats. When you just choose two or three hypotheses and you run an experiment, you often deploy it and you realize, actually, this message was really not good. I want to add in another one. A lot of people say, well, you have to run a brand new experiment, but can we add a condition while the experiment's running? Does that mean we have to throw out all the old data, or are there ways we can actually incorporate it? And as I mentioned, really open to applying collaboratively NIH other grants. Um, I'm not sure how it works in stats exactly. I think you normally want a behavioral PI. I can help to find people or help in writing those kinds of grants. Um, just to keep on with the laundry list. <laughs> Another thing that's come up is the incorporating the cost of conditions. So normally when you run a uniform random experiment, you don't worry about these things. You run it and later on you have a big discussion. A is better than B by how much is it worth the cost. But if you're doing dynamic experiments, if we're working with a company that's actually sending test messages now, they may want to understand, well, if we incorporate the idea that A is more costly than B. For example, this text message asking people to plan their day is more costly than the message saying, hey, go and take a walk, because it may impose a cost on people's time, or it may mean that they're more likely to drop out. How do we handle issues like that? And you know, in reinforcement learning, I don't know that literature, um, the, the entire literature, but I haven't seen things that um, kind of try to incorporate this in a way that you could do dynamically, where you kind of think about not just um, what the effectiveness of an action is, but also how do you kind of directly build in some notion of the cost. It'd be super relevant to economists as well as to um, people in health comparative effectiveness research. Another issue that's just coming up as soon as I run experiments is we want to do adaptive randomization, right? But often we have a proximal outcome. And that's only correlated with what we're going to care about. So to be concrete in my setting, oh yeah, please. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, yes. Uh -huh. Exactly, yeah. So uh, you told me about that last week. I started reading up on it. No, no, it's a great connection. So that's the kind of thing we want to read up on and understand how to cut, tie that in with this. Yeah, no, if I'm just making the connection. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. That, that's a great point. I think, um, I think those are all open questions. So I think the, the current application we're looking at right now, that is an issue in terms of wanting to learn the cost, right? So this is like a, a chatbot in education. And we're trying to think, well, if we give people extra practice and problems, there's a cost because they take more time. But we don't know what that, how to weigh the cost of more time versus them learning more. So that's something that could be, could be the issue. If you have some well-defined reward, you can try to push back. You can, like come, you can use that reward to kind of learn costs. But sometimes it's a matter of how do you elicit it from stakeholders. And I think maybe the key, here's an example of a deliverable. A paper saying, here's an algorithm. I'm going to give you some parameters to let you specify what the cost is of this action relative to the reward. And here's how the behavior changes based on how you specify it. So that's one example of another direction where it's not learning the cost, but you're helping people understand. You, first of all, get them thinking about cost. People are not thinking about that, right? And if they do specify, they can understand how it changes the algorithm's behavior. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think that's a, it. Sounds really interesting. Set of directions. Yeah. Uh, yeah, no, that, that's a really interesting set of points. But like the first is effectiveness, then you find things that this cost. But I think non inferiority setting is a really interesting one. Yeah. Yeah, I think, and I'm repeating all this back because I'm recording so then we can revisit these great ideas, but I think this is another really good setting, which is what is the burden to the person of receiving this? And also, what are the burden to the resources of producing this condition? So to be really concrete, um, I think you're thinking about settings where you ask someone like to reflect, to try and get them to exercise versus you give them a message. There's a bigger burden on the participants. In terms of resources, um, if we're running experiments where we keep adding conditions, it's really easy to add another message in text. But if we want, suppose we're finding that like visual messages, like you know, a nice picture of someone like, maybe even just putting the same text into an image. So in the study B. Bass and I are looking at, they have that ability. Maybe having images like, you're gonna feel better after you exercise. Putting that in image format might be better. But again, there's a cost for producing that image, getting a designer. Ah, resource, the person receiving the message, yeah. yeah. And I should say, this is me throwing out a whole bunch of things I think, it sounds like you guys are finding very interesting discussion. I'll go to the really nice, well-formulated research that I published on already um, next. But this is great discussion, thanks. Oh, Western Ontario. Oh, yes, I, I met him. I forgot about that. Yeah, thanks for that link. 
Ah, oh, that's a great idea. Okay. Yeah, that's a great connection. Yeah. And so the um, so this idea about the proximal outcome is only correlated with what we eventually care about. So, for example, I'll just give you an example from research we're doing now. We give students explanations to help them of a concept, and we ask them to rate it. And that's problematic because it's subjective. But it is actually, you give a rating of a 0 to 10. It's actually a variable that gives you a lot of data. It's ordinal. But we know that that's just correlated with what we want, which is, does the expression help them learn? So, you know, how should we think about this? How should we change, like, expression exploitation? Should we do adapt randomization less and be more uniform? based on what the relationship is between a proximal outcome and the f future one. If the correlation is zero, then don't do any adaptive randomization. If the correlation is one, then run wild and free. But for all those cases where it's in between, we need frameworks for understanding how to trade them off. And is, the is it that we don't yet know what the correlation is and we're going to figure it out later? Is it that, for example, you do an experiment because you thought you were going to optimize for A, but actually it turns out B is a much better measure? This is what often happens when you run behavioral experiments. There's a whole, I mean, sorry, you guys know this, but a lot of people who run these won't be aware. There's a whole cluster of dependent variables, and you're not quite sure which one is the best measure. And of course, there are lots of issues here where people worry about multiple hypothesis testing and p-hacking. Um, one very specific um, thing that's come up is, how do we do adaptive randomization when you have um, a bit of non-stationarity? It's not as bad as like the whole population changing. But this is something I raised a couple of you. I, I want to say, everyone's on board with what I mean by adaptive randomization right now, right? You see the outcomes higher, you put more people in that condition. So this is um, a paper that's under review of Journal of Educational Data Mining. You can see the URL, tiny.cc, J Banner's Power. And I think I said it on to a few of you. Um, you can just skim it. I think you, you guys will get the main point pretty quickly. And, and you might even find it very straightforward. It's just that we kind of did that first, and then we realized after diving into it, um, how to tie it best to stats literature. We knew some literature, but then we found more and more, and you guys suggested a ton. But here's the kind of basic idea. Um, if you're giving students explanations, like let's say explanation A is better than B, and it's better for high-performing students and low-performing. But here's the problem. The high-performing students, they procrastinate. So you give someone explanations, like in a quiz. You give them a quiz on Monday, and like a bunch of 50 students come in on Monday. 50 on Tuesday, 50 on Wednesday, 50 on Thursday. But the low-performing students come in first. So you start to see that A is better than B. And so you say, okay, we put more people into A, 60% versus 40. But here's the problem. There's a correlation between who's arriving and their performance on the dependent variable, the outcome. So now the high-performing students start coming, and they start driving the mean up. But you're already assigning more people to A, like 60%, 70%. And so now you get high performers coming in who drive the mean up even more. Is it clear what I mean in that setting? Exactly, yeah. And so how do we handle issues like that? And what, what kind of assumptions do we make or under what conditions is that like deadly and stop doing that randomization? Can we detect it by measuring a dependent variable? Those kinds of issues come up. And the big issue there is that it can really drive a pure type one error rate um, when in fact there's no effect at all. And then you get biased estimates of what the true um, means are. So that's something that, that we're particularly worried about because it comes up in applications. Um, more generally, um, Right now, you know, there's a lot of talk in psychology about replication crises and so on. And one thing I think is interesting to explore is if you get people to replicate experiments where you're using things like dynamic experimentation, adaptive randomization, will that mean that people are more willing to replicate? So, for example, if I run an experiment right now and I show that expression A looks better than B, a lot of instructors would say it is immoral to run that experiment again. We've shown A is better than B. And that's a problem, right? And some, some researchers would agree with you. But the challenge there is that that's problematic because there are lots of reasons they may not replicate. The statistical effect may not really be there. It may be the case that the boundary conditions have changed. You know, the way you, the way you re-implement these studies is actually a bit different. It may be that the pa participant population of tasks is different. So I think to get towards replication, it'd be interesting to think about whether using dynamic experimentation might make people more open to these kinds of replications, where you can replicate and either set a prior, like let's put more people in A versus B, and also using dynamic experimentation, you can quickly get to the truth it's like positives are Bayesian in front. If your priors are right, great, you get there fast. But if your priors are wrong, at least you can still learn. And I think one thing I say to people, I'm not sure how compelling they find it, psychologists find it very compelling, is you are always running an experiment. When you deliver a message or give an app, 
It's just that 100% of people in one condition, 0% of people in any alternative. And so I think just pushing people to say, well, is it 0 or should it be 5% or 10%? I think this is a really powerful idea. But we haven't done the user studies to show this. OK, and one thing I would say is that, um, again, like I said, we have built this actually web service because I ran these experiments you know, over the last five, six years. And there's a lot of overhead, and we do things suboptimally in many ways. So we actually have this web service that basically provides an API. So if we actually implement this API in the Dietlands app, which you're going to hear about next. So if you have a colleague or someone who's running a mobile app, you want to get them to build an experimentation framework. That's a bunch of work. But actually, once they have a set of experimentation, you can actually plug into our API. And the nice thing about that is that you then, separate from the app and decide the experiment, you get your behavioral scientists to do it. Data flows back in real time. And you can see exactly what's coming from the first time it's launched, even before it's launched. And then we actually have different algorithms. So you can just upload a different algorithm to this open source um, repository. And then this is a really nice framework for a lot of you to be able to say, we want to test out different algorithms for experimentation in real time. And this is a bit of a glue between people who might have an app or run experiments, and then actually being able to test out more sophisticated algorithms and models. Yeah, sure. That, that stuff's actually not the hard part. The hard part is actually just making it easy for someone who just did an experiment to hook in. But yeah, it provides all that. I think the value add to you guys is, you might say, you know what, here's the algorithm I want to test out. And then, all we, then what we have to do is just persuade some computer science grad student at U of T that that's an interesting idea. And they can modify that code and test these algorithms out. And we can compare different algorithms. And we've actually deployed this um, in several online courses. We did in some online um, lab studies. And we're using it for our research with um, this Dietlands app. And so I think the big theme then is, for me, is thinking, how do we um, provide interfaces to algorithms for dynamic experiments? And when I say interfaces here, this is the human interaction part. We want to let in scientists and designers, designers of technology or, or scientists who design experiments, to be able to modify features of the algorithm. So for example, they can handle the issues we've raised before. They can be uniformly randomizing more or less. They can get certain kinds of statistical guarantees. So this is the kind of high level vision. How do we take these algorithms and models and make them into actual tools people can use? So any questions or comments on all that? I know it's a long prelude, but I think that kind of gives you the sense of the, um, what we're really excited about moving forward. And I should say, if you do look at my website, a lot of my work's actually in education. Um, so I'm running similar experiments in education all the time, like getting people to set goals, motivating students, giving them good explanations. But I'm kind of emphasizing my health behavior change work. So I kind of think about health behavior change as a bit of a learning problem. And a lot of the studies we run actually with students. So the idea is we want to think about students holistically. How do we help students learn, but also be healthy, deal with mental health issues, manage stress? Um, but I'm very open to running you know, lab studies, online studies, students, and, and real populations. It's just that getting real populations normally involves a lot more resources than like a grant on that topic. OK, so that's all the prelude, which is probably half the talk. And you know what? I could just stop now. I bet you guys, hopefully these guys got a lot out of it. We have a lot to talk about. But here's the more kind of standard talk. OK, so as I mentioned, I'm interested in issues like how do we use technology to enhance mental health, exercise, nutrition, eating. And you guys are all sold. This has huge promise. Um, getting people to quit smoking or deal with depression. In the UK, you can actually write a prescription for cognitive behavior therapy. And I've done work in the past with clinical psychologists on how do we help people learn things like cognitive behavior therapy. In the context of a smartphone app, you know, there's lots of apps out there, but what I think we really need to do is start figuring out, well, how do we make components of these apps more effective? like prompt people with questions that help them actually change behavior. Or figure out what are the right kind of messages that are going to motivate people. And this is where the behavioral science aspect comes in. There are tons of published papers, but I think if you take a given app, the question of how do we best motivate people in it is a very open one. And the big challenge here is that these resources always need improvements. The most possible app in the App Store um, need, could be improved substantially. And I think that a lot of the reviews show that many of these apps don't actually have a measurable benefit. And I don't think the problem is that people haven't put thought into it. I think the problem is that you can't always predict what works in the real world. And so the classic human computer interaction approach is you need to design something, implement it, evaluate it, and then iteratively improve this. So we need to always be improving these, these um, apps, these experiences, this software. 
And so the vision that I'm excited about, just to talk about in terms of education, is how do you build systems that perpetually improve just like real people do? So for example, in online courses, we give students problems, and we might give them explanations for how to solve a problem. But a real teacher wouldn't give the same explanation to a thousand people. They would naturally vary how they explain things, and this allows them to discover what explanations are better on average, or to discover which explanations work for different subgroups of people. And so my vision is how do we take any piece of technology and use experiments to transform that into a self-improving system? You can guess what kind of approach I'm gonna take. Merging things like A-B testing with randomized experiments. So here's the high-level approach of everything that we do, the vision that guides us. We want to reimagine experiments so that they're collaborative, dynamic, and personalized. And so it's how we tackle issues in HCI education and health. When we design an experiment, we draw on work, for example, in cognitive science, and you know, publish papers in cognitive psychology with social psychologists with clinical psychologists, but we also work closely with designers. So whenever we deploy a field experiment now, we conduct qualitative interviews with designers, um, we try and think about different experimental conditions, you know, everyone gets their condition, and they can give feedback on others, so we can actually compare ideas that come from people's practical wisdom, but as well as behavioral science theory. And so that's the collaborative experimentation part. Of course, the other part I think you guys are all on board with, how do we do dynamic experimentation so we can enhance and personalize outcomes? And this is where I draw my background on, in Bayesian statistics and machine learning. So in my PhD, I applied Bayesian statistics and machine learning to modeling cognition, but now I apply it directly to actually building systems that will improve. And this is why I'm especially excited to interact with a lot of you. Now, this is nice in terms of pathway to the vision of, of self-improving systems, but what's missing from this? A real human being is always adding new actions. So we need a way to keep adding conditions to any experiment. And this is where I draw on work from crowdsourcing and human computation. And so I actually think of this, the way I see this to computer scientists is, this is the vision. We need to build intelligent technology for people. But how do we tackle this? We need to combine human intelligence with machine learning. And so the idea here is that this is what's called human computation. There's a conference, AAAI conference on human computation and crowdsourcing. So the idea is when you want to build a system, you have to figure out what you outsource to a human being and what you pass off to an algorithm and how do you get them to work together. And so this is where we use methods like crowdsourcing to come up with new ideas or collaborative design so that when we're running experiments, behavioral scientists, designers can keep adding new ideas in. Now, if you want to do this tomorrow, like for any app on your phone, could you do it? Almost definitely not. Plugging in algorithms, adding new conditions. So that's exactly why we built this web service that Ken was asking about. If you use this service, the basic idea is that it kind of guarantees that you can take any experiment and do all these crazy things with it. Get data in real time, add new conditions, modify the algorithm. How is my speed or clarity of talking? Yeah. Yes. Yes, exactly. So it's an open source GitHub report I pointed to. I'll be honest, it's not that we have anything fancy in there. We have like Thompson sampling for beta Bernoulli, and we have like contextual Thompson sampling with Bayesian linear regression. You guys can put all kinds of amazing things in, but yes, you can just upload it directly to the, to the GitHub repo. My research program will handle the pull request, and then you just declare like, okay, here's our experiment, let's plug it in. So to be super concrete, for the study with BBAS and diet lens, we basically got them to build in to their app a notification panel that basically makes a call out to our server. And so we say, okay, here's the experiment one. And then we decide in some JSON, here's experiment. And then if Lauren said, hey, change that, we just go and change that right away. Because then it calls. And then you can plug in different algorithms, you can swap out which algorithms running in real time. The really nice thing is you see all the data. It's passed back from the app to the cloud. I found it works well because basically if I tell someone, make sure it works with this server, with this service, I know I can do everything I want. So I kind of, this is a spec that I figured out over time. So if they use this, I know that I'm getting data in real time. I know that I can modify how things are being delivered. Whereas when I tried to implement algorithms directly in software before, it's just, I, I wouldn't recommend that because I did lots of time and I didn't do it too well. And for example, to be really concrete, 
If you want to, if Jesse wanted to put an algorithm in there, I would say, Jesse, upload the algorithm or modify ours, and let's run a mechanical Turk study. Because we actually have software, survey software, Qualtrics to set up. You could run that study right away, like tomorrow. And you could actually see in real time. Participants are coming in, they're responding. Here's how your algorithms assign them to conditions. So that's a nice general tip of what we do is before any field experiment, we actually can test out the algorithms and models in a kind of lab study that's online. And in a way for statistics and ML, that's what you guys really care about is this real-time setting. Um, but it's nice to do that where you can get people like in an hour for like $2 a piece first before you go into the field. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, I mean, it's, it's just limited by your budget. So, you know, if you make a, a nice simple experiment that's a dollar, then it's a thousand dollars, a thirteen hundred dollars to run a thousand people. Yeah. Oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. But but you raise a really good point, and um, I should say this is very cross disciplinary. Um, so, um, here, here's a really nice idea from someone at Harvard in human interaction. He says, Joseph, what is your disciplinary superpower? Right? You guys know what your superpowers are. If you go to medical people and tell them you use they're going to say that makes no sense. You can learn zero. And I would say, maybe it's not zero, maybe it's a bit more. So here's what psychologists' superpower is, I think. They know how to take a railroad problem and translate it into something you can study in a laboratory setting. They know how to do studies that you care about people with depression. How do we study the people who actually are on mechanical Turk? I will say it won't work for everything. A lot of what I do is try and think of where we can align the field problem with a lab study. And that's why I showed you exercise messages on mental health and CBT, because you could imagine testing out which CBT effects work for a lab population that might generalize the real world. And I should be clear, maybe 90% of things don't generalize, but all, my job is to find the 10% that do. And that's a nice way of just getting research out. And you kind of get the benefits like you've said of large samples. But your colleagues in medical school will say, this will never work. Let's just show them some examples that can work 1% of the time, you know? And that might revolutionize the way they think. <laughs> okay, so that's my high level kind of view. So, um, the vision is perpetually improving systems, and the approach is collaborative, dynamic, personalized experimentation. So let me give you three quick examples. The first is a study that we did on crowdsourcing and dynamically testing student explanations. And you can just think to yourself, how do you translate this to the health context? The second is a Kai paper on um, how do we make experimentation more instructor-centered? And the third is just an example of the kinds of studies we want to run to discover how to personalize. And these are more illustrative than anything else of the kind of thing we want to do in the future. We basically want to take everything we did here and do it in a much better way in the field. And in terms of the future, as I mentioned, I want to do more innovative kinds of experiments and think about what statistics relevant work there is. Okay, so to sum up this study, basically what we showed is we built a system where you can crowdsource explanations from students, and then by using a multi arm bandit, you could, Thompson sampling, you can actually get explanations that are as good as those of a real instructor. So here's the setup. The problem is that in online courses, you give people problems. And they often don't really learn from them. So one way this has been shown in educational psych is giving people instructional explanations that explain the key principle. So maybe we can actually experiment to figure out which explanations are best. But if, you, if I go to my colleagues, they say, Joseph, I hardly have time to write any explanation. Most online courses don't have explanations. How do you expect me to write multiple? So the idea here is we drew on some past work also from Kai and in my cognitive psychology line of work. If you ask people to explain an idea, like ask someone, explain why your answer is correct, this can actually help them learn. And so this is actually what a big part of my dissertation was on. There's like 2,000 papers on this topic, and I think there should be 3,000 more, you know? 
how do you ask people questions to help them learn? And in the health setting, there's a lot of work showing that asking people questions can help them like form plans, like implementation intentions, and guide their behavior. So I think this question asking idea is a really nice one because you can squeeze it into any app. And the key thing is the psychology comes in where, you know, you might see two questions that look exactly the same. But the reason Daniel Kahneman got a Nobel Prize is by showing that small changes in how you frame something, if they hook into someone's psychology, can have a big effect on people's behavior. So that's where the psychology comes in. So the idea here is we're going to tell students to explain why the answers are correct. And this actually could be a way of adding new conditions in, because we can take their explanation and pass it to someone else. Of course, the explanations may not be good, and that's why we're going to do a dynamic experiment with Thompson sampling. So this is a linear scale paper from two years ago, three years well. So here's the setup. We give people problems, and they attempt it. Eventually, they get the answer. Then we give them an explanation for why the answer is correct. And this is the thing that we're experimenting on. This is what we want to be our intelligent agent. We ask them to rate how healthy the explanation was on a scale from 0 to 10, which my psychology colleagues jump on me because they say it's subjective and it's problematic. And I agree with them. I was very skeptical. But this works better than a measure like accuracy in the next problem for two reasons. One is that accuracy in the next problem is binary. Here we have a graded measure. Also, accuracy in the next problem is a function of the explanation you get and many other things, whereas their rating is actually directly based on the explanation. So I'm going to show you that if we optimize for the shorter measure, their ratings, we get explanations that help learning overall. So that's our basic setup for the experiment. And a big part of the psychological insight here, the human computer interaction, HCI, was designing this so we could have a setting where we could actually get these algorithms to work well. Because my colleagues tried like five other things and they didn't have any effect. We also tell them to help you learn, explain your own words why the answer is correct. And you guys see why this is sneaky, right? We are helping them learn. But also, if their explanation was longer than 50 characters, and they checked a box saying that it might be helpful to other people, we then add it to our experiment. Any questions on this? Right now, we're doing it all. Well, actually, here's the interesting. It's automatic and human. If it's more than 50 characters, so here's the criteria, more than 50 characters, that's automatic. But we ask the learner themselves, check this box if you think we should give this to other people. So the human being, this is human competition. They're doing some of the competition for us. And you'd be surprised. A lot of people just don't check that box because they know they're nonsense. So this is the HCI insight, right? How do you get a human being to do something that you could have spent two years billing NLP for? OK, now, of course, many of these explanations may not be good. So we basically model this as a multi arm bandit, which it's not clear whether people see it as reinforcing learning or not. Mike Littman seems to. Other people seem to see it as separate. But it's the most basic form. And I'll say what it is just to over-explain. I'm sure a lot of you know. But basically, in a bandit, you have a set of actions. In this case, they're the explanations. And we want to optimize the reward. In this case, reward is rating from 0 to 10 of how health an explanation is. So we now need a policy. There's, I mean, when I review for NIPS or NeurIPS, there's tons of papers on bandits. I went with Thompson sampling, and I think you guys, you guys are all on board with why I went for Thompson sampling. How do we help our behavioral scientists understand what upper confidence bound is doing? How can they map it onto what is already happening? Thompson sampling is interpretable as weighted randomization. Yeah, uh, yeah. Do you want to say what upper confidence bound is? Because I think you use that algorithm, right? Yeah. yeah. And I think the nice thing about upper confidence bound is that you can modify the algorithm very easily by changing where the bound is, right? Like, there are lots of ways to modify it. Thompson's sound requires more work. The other nice intuition for upper confidence bound is you basically say, um, how good could this be? And whatever could be really good, whatever has the highest bound, you choose that. We actually put priors in our algorithm that get that idea off at the beginning. Uh, Thompson's sampling, though, the key idea here is that the probability of assigning people to conditions is proportional to the probability that this is the highest rated explanation. 
So basically, um, and it's a nice intuitive idea. And it extends also to a case even where you have covariates. What's the probability of assigning people to conditions? It's based on the probability that's the best condition based on the data you've seen so far. So it kind of captures your information about the means as well as the uncertainty, the sample size. And so the model we use here, I think there are lots of issues with it and the ways it could be improved, but you know, it was a first pass. We model the probability of an explanation of being rated as helpful as following a beta distribution. And so the idea, we use parameters beta 19 and one. So it's equivalent to saying, before you see any data, let's act as if each explanation got a nine rating and a 10 rating. And the idea was actually, we did some simulations. If you use something like beta one and one or beta five and five, um, you end up that a lot of explanations don't get tested. The idea that you have a prior that explanations was rate, got a rating of nine and a rating of 10 is essentially capturing what upper confidence model is saying. Before I see any data, I think it's good. I think it's a 9.5, but I'm really not certain about that. So you can be overwhelmed very easily. But this enforces that new explanations are tested out. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, so the probability of an explanation being rated helpful. Yes. Yes, exactly. So I should have had the whole picture. So basically the prior is that there's a beta distribution, which is representing probability and expression will be rated helpful. Then there's a binomial likelihood function with 10 samples, and the probability of success comes from that beta distribution. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Yeah, and so, so the key intuition here for everyone is, if you give someone, so at the beginning, you have three explanations. We all pretend like they have a nine and a 10, nine and a 10, nine and a 10. Explanation one gets an eight. It's like saying there were eight thumbs up, eight successes, and two failures. And then you just add that to the beta. It goes from beta 19, one to beta 19 plus eight, beta one plus two. So it's a really nice, simple algorithm. It runs in JavaScript in the browser. And it's very intuitive for people to understand. You will notice we're kind of overweighting the data in a way. Because we could have made this like beta, you know, uh, 1.9 and 0.1. But this is also a way of kind of like increasing exploitation. Yeah. Um, so here I'm just talking actually about the um, beta parameters. Yeah, the, the, so the, the alpha i and the beta i. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Huh? Exactly. This is a vector of alpha i and beta i um, for all the different explanations. Yeah. So, so you use this package two terms, then one is that you are biasing towards one thing. Yes. Another one is basically, uh, I don't know which one is good, so let's do each option one or ten or something like that. Uh -huh. So again, I think it's coming from more psychological background is why you're doing more on the positive side. Um, no, honestly, it's, um, it's, this is the first, like, when we published learning skills, this was the first papers to actually deploy balance in real time. So I think this was just the decision we made at that point that seemed reasonable. Um, the positivity thing is actually meant to capture upper confidence bounds idea. If you put like a prior of like beta five and five, like, then what you end up with is that, okay, here's an example. If you start with a prior that actually, hey, there was one rating of five, and you get something that comes in, um, if it gets, so let me think of this, okay. When you have a prior that thinks that, for example, the outcome is a rating of five, you just don't explore. Because as soon as something else has a rating of seven or eight, that's gonna dominate. Right, yeah. that's the crazy that once you see enough data, a prior doesn't Yeah, yeah, that's true. We're almost always in situations where the priors matter, but yes, that's exactly right. So I think the idea is we want a prior where they can be easily overwhelmed. This looks good, let's test it out. Actually, no, it's crap, stop right away. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. 
Yeah. Yes. Yeah. I think that's a great question. And honestly, um, the reason we so chose this whole setup is we should have like three more papers on how do we set prize in different situations. There's these statistics questions, exactly like what you said about the ethics of it. But also, this is a, a, a human competition, HCI ML question. When do instructors want to put high priors on something? When do they want to put low? Should we kind of favor their beliefs more highly in the setting, or should we think that they're wrong? So I think this is just a whole open space. I think this is more framework for answering those kinds of questions. I think that's a fascinating set of ideas to explore. And this is what I talked about where I want to think of these algorithms as um, how do we make interfaces to these algorithms? Setting priors is one really intuitive interface. But we haven't empirically tested. Is the beta a reasonable way to do it? Yeah. Some records suggest many better ways. But I think this is the HCI question. How do we let a clinician or other people set priors in a way that will make sense for the data collection process? How do we help them interpret how the data is overwhelming or complementing their priors? I think those are fascinating questions. And those are good questions if you want to build good railroad systems. Yeah? It keeps expanding. Sorry, it, yeah, sorry, so it's not a priority. It's just whatever explanations are in there get assigned, and there's a probability distribution over them. Yeah, so, um, so what do you mean? Do you mean like a distribution of action eight, one, two, three? Yeah. Yes. Oh, I see. Okay. Actually, that's interesting. That's a nice feature of Thompson sampling, actually. Um, when you have just two explanations, right, then you basically, Thompson sampling essentially, the way it works is to say is, um, you basically get this distribution over explanations by pulling samples from each of the distributions over the actions. And then whichever, so you just sample from this beta. Like you get a point, point 0.8, there's a point 0.7. Whichever one is higher, you produce. Is the eight just zero? Um, no, no, sorry, um, a, a could be explanation one, two, three, or four. So you choose one explanation to give people. And so when you add a fifth explanation, it just comes in with its own beta prior, right? Which is like nine, nine and 10. And so that's the nice thing is it just readjusts your probability distribution automatically. Well, it's not as harmful as um, it's not as harmful as giving them bad treatments. But if you want to run this from an instructor, they're going to say, "I'm giving students poor explanations by other students. This is bad for them." Like the horizon here is like 500 students or something. Yeah. So I think, and to be honest, this is not meant to do statistical inference. This is just meant to optimize the system. How do we get good explanations? Yeah. But I think the the examples here raise a whole bunch of interesting issues, which are things we're really excited to explore. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, I think that would be a great extension. Yes. Yeah, I think it would be super interesting to apply those to these different settings. And this is just one. We can think of five other settings, and we can see which of those algorithms are appropriate for different kinds of assumptions about the structure of the data and other features. Yeah. Cool. So I guess, uh, so I think everyone gets a kind of key idea about in terms of sampling and how we model this problem. And I know we're short on time. When should I wrap up, Beavers? Okay, fine, Mr. That sounds good. Great. No, it's fine. I think you guys got, you guys, what have you gone from the talk so far? Actually, let me prompt you. What did you guys learn from this talk that was interesting, and what is it going to change in what you do next? I'll give you 10 seconds to think about that before I start rolling. <laughs> okay, great, okay. Susan has a takeaway. Great, so this is the setting here. 
here's the actual deployment. We deployed this with just 150 people, and we did this on Amazon Mechanical Turk, because we tried to use problems that people wouldn't be that familiar with. We chose 150 because we want this to work in the size of a big undergrad class. We don't just want methods that you need 10,000 people for. So if we can get it working here, that's good. At the beginning, there are actually no explanations. After a while, someone generates one. It's above 50 characters. They say it's useful, it gets added in. Then you might get a couple. And so what you essentially have is this dynamic updating. As people rate higher explanations, uh, explanations that are higher, they get presented more often. And what you end up with at the end is a probability distribution over explanations. Now, one reason the system works is it, it can't get that. You don't have enough evidence for that. What you end up with is something more like this. A few explanations have higher probability, some have lower. So it gets higher rate explanations, but does that actually help learning? So we did a separate experiment. We took this probability distribution of explanations and compared it to original problems that had no explanations at all, like many online courses, the problems with this adapt axis, adaptive explanation system. These are sampled from the probability distribution over explanations. We also compared this to explanations that were filtered out. So these are explanations that, they, that had less than 5% probability. So they're seen as lower quality. And gold standard, we had the instructor write an explanation. So here's the actual results. What I'm showing you on the vertical axis is accuracy increase. We give them a pretest on math, then we actually give them each of these four conditions, randomized people, and then we have a post test. So how much is the accuracy increase from pre to post? So it does impact learning. Even though they're crowdsourcing students, once you run them through Thompson sampling, we get higher rated explanations that also help learning. So here's the, here the skeptic. Well, of course an explanation helps because you're comparing it to nothing. Any explanation would have helped, right? Actually, explanations that have less than 5% probability had no, they're like giving nothing at all. So it matters that we're filtering out the better explanations. Finally, how good does the system have to be compared to the instructors for it to be worthwhile? Is it half as good? Is it a third as good? Oh, sorry, yeah. Yeah, that's very bad terminology. Filtered out. No, no, I should change that. Yeah, filtered out because there were less than 5% probability. Yeah, so what was all of them? Exactly. Whereas in this one, it's actually, a pro we sample them according to the probability distribution. So 5% of the time you get these ones. So there's actually no significant difference in this setting between the instructor's explanations and the ones from the system. And we don't have enough data to estimate that reliably, but we can get that if we run a bigger study. And we're running field studies on this, hopefully in the next three, four, six months. I have a grant from Office of Naval Research to apply contextual bandits to personalizing explanations. Yeah. Okay. So the key contributions here are, here's actually crowdsourcing, learner sourcing from self-interested contributors. We get the people themselves to generate. And you know, one of the first demonstrations of how we actually use dynamic experimentation to put data into practice. It's published. Of course, Google does this all the time. And there are a lot of, this is just the first step. There are tons of ways we can improve this in the future. Um, health plug, what we want to do, Bibas and I, is actually send people messages to get an exercise and tell them, which message do you think we should have sent you? So they're actually a part of the system. They generate a message we could, which we can then test out on them, but also other people. So that's the HCI psychology part. Build a system where we can get people to contribute in a useful way that we can test the ideas in an experiment. So this other work, and I, I, I'll skim through this quickly, is um, instructor sense experimentation. So this is a Kai paper, and I'll be really quick. But the key contribution here is, how do we build a tool so that instructors can more easily conduct experiments? I think the key, there's a lot in this paper, it's on my website, but here's the key insight for you guys. We built a tool that let instructors design different explanations, different feedback messages. And then we actually deploy it with REL students, three Harvard courses, and we use Thompson sampling to choose the, the explanations that have the highest rating. And so this is a bit more like a traditional RCT, right? The instructor gets a dashboard where they can see the probability of the explanation, mean student rating, how many students, and the standard deviation. And we didn't get amazing results here, and I wouldn't necessarily say the, the we're not, these are not gonna be necessarily um, publishable studies in a psychology education journal. But the key idea here was showing, testing out was this an effective approach for instructors? So for instructors, they actually, here's some nice insights. They like that this designing experiment helped them reflect on pedagogy. 
just for writing out different versions, even if they don't get any significant data that helped them. They felt this made research practical. I could actually do research in my own course using this tool. Actually, Susan, your students could actually run this in their Harvard courses. Yeah. And they like that it directly helps students. Improve the experience of many of these students by giving them answers that are more helpful. The earlier ones can help improve the experience of later students. That's pretty neat. Another interesting thing is, this is a, just a bit of data from a survey. Students like the approach. I assume companies are always A-B testing on me, so the data I provide can help other people learn. I think this is a really important set of issues to explore in terms of how do people feel when they're involved in these randomized experiments. Are they more open to a dynamic experiment than a traditional one? Now, how is this relevant? Instructors probably don't like this approach, but what about behavioral scientists? And I'll just flag this, I mentioned a few of you, but this is under review of journal of education data mining, but basically, Anna Rafferty, um, one of my colleagues, assistant professor in computer science, and I looked at how, what are the consequences of using banded assignments? And we find, you know, kind of things that you, you might expect, but we quantify them. Increased type one errors in some cases. When you have a population where high performers come later, it biases things more. So we need to figure out how do we help behavioral scientists understand when they can use these methods and how they can analyze them. And I think, just speaking to Ken, we have had some great ideas about how we should actually modify our algorithms to make them better for analysis. But again, this is a gigantic, wild open space. Um, and just to illustrate, maybe this is, tell me if this is obvious to all of you, but we, we, what I'm really trying to do now is experiments where we send people interventions and we figure out how to personalize. So for example, this is just a trend, but if we send people messages like emails, you might see that like this email was not any better than that in, in terms of increasing response rate, right? But actually once you break up the analysis, you can see that there might be a trend for a qualitative or cross of interaction where one condition is better than another for a subgroup of people. This is exactly what we're aiming for. It's just that they're surprisingly hard to get in lab studies and field studies, but this is what I'm really excited about. Showing real-world examples where we can have these cross of interactions, and we can show people, you can build a self-improving, self-personalizing system by applying um, methods from statistics and machine learning to these experiments. So it's like automatic personalization. But again, people know what the behavioral science will say. How are we analyzing that data? What are the issues that come up? And if you can help us solve those, you know, maybe in 10 years, everyone is doing dynamic experiments. Okay, um, so here's a, just to leave you with, this is the kind of experiment I'm running now, and uh, because it is very hard to get these effects. Most things have no effect at all. Factorial experiments where we might run three or four factors at once, maybe with two or three conditions. I like three conditions, and I can say more about why. And we have a ton of context and covariates, but we need to think about how we include those, how we model those, how we, um, make decisions about using contextual bandits to figure out what's working for different subgroups. And there's some work we're doing with Susan Athey, who's an economist at Stanford, where we're looking at charitable giving on this contextual band issue, but I think there are tons of open questions here. Um, I can skip over that, but basically just intuitively so people get the ideas that people might be being assigned um, with different probabilities based on the subgroup that they belong in. Um, this is one naive way of showing it. I think there are much better ways of pooling data. Okay, so future directions, email interventions, app notifications, text messages to get people to exercise, prompts and messages to well, wellness and mental health, but I'm pretty open. To make this work, I have to be pretty opportunistic. I have to be really clever about finding where we actually gonna run experiments that show these qualitative interactions, that actually show to discover or personalize. So that's kind of part of my job from the HCI and behavioral science. And then once we get those effects, um, working with machine learning applied stats people to show how we can analyze that data. And we've been doing some of that ourselves, but I have a feeling we can do it better with you guys. Just an example, but I think you'll see more on diet lens about these kinds of studies. Um, about some mental health, that's a link to a paper that illustrates the kind of work that we're doing. Okay, so just to sum up, so I saw this vision of perpetually improving systems. How do we get every piece of technology to be like that? And I think we can do it by Rethinking experimentation to be collaborative, dynamic, and personalized. I give you one example of crowdsourcing and dynamically testing student explanations, where we could end up with explanations as good as those of a real instructor. A Kai paper where we showed that instructors um, really appreciate this kind of approach, and we give them systems that can use Thompson sampling to select explanations. You can plug your algorithms and models into those systems or tell us how to change it. And we need to do more work now on how to help behavioral scientists analyze that kind of data. Then I give you examples of what we're looking for, discovering how to personalize from experiments and figuring out, again, how do we help behavioral scientists analyze data where we use adaptive randomization, especially once you've got covariates involved. And in the future, um, I think that's really touching on those questions I raised at the beginning. 
a lot of these statistical questions that are open. Um, and I'll just pop those up on the screen. There's the second one. Great. And we can discuss those more. All right, thank you.